Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello and welcome back to NPTEL the national program on technology enhanced learning being brought to you by the Indian Institutes of Technology and the Indian Institute of Science our course is entitled cultural studies we are in module 3 and uh, today in fact is uh, lecture 10 the last lecture in module 3 which is entitled sites of cultural studies by sites of cultural studies we refer to um, where cultural studies happens okay uh, sites in the sense of location and we looked at several such uh, sites namely uh, for instance space, time, the body, consumption etc. And today we shall be looking at a field from science biology and we are going to discuss uh, the different aspects or at least some of the aspects okay we do not have time uh, to look at all uh, you know the features or aspects of cultural studies analyses of biology and we will look at a few aspects of how bi biology is looked at in cultural studies right so before we go to biology let's do a recap of what we have discussed in the last lecture the last lecture as you uh, recall was devoted to consumption in fact it was part 2 in the series of lectures um, uh, or it was part sorry part 2 in the two part lecture on consumption and we saw that cultural studies and food forms uh, you know um, uh, an area or a domain of investigation and uh, among you know some of the important areas that may be looked at here are for instance as we saw nationalism and diet, uh, eating in and eating out, uh, eating and identity, disorders, anxieties and ethics as far as food is concerned. Right? So, you see that obviously, there would be and would be overlapping of domains uh, between say for instance sociology, anthropology and cultural studies um, more than in other domains that we have seen. But we uh, looked at one cultural practice okay, namely that of eating out and we um, saw how the cultural practice or phenomenon of eating out uh, so much could be said you know uh, there is a whole discourse from cultural studies on the phenomenon of eating out. We also saw that eating out as a cultural practice entails a paradox and the paradox is one uh, the one uh, aspect of the paradox is that definitely eating out is a source of pleasure where one gets one feels that one has a sense of power and choice. Okay? It also entails identity formation, but on the other hand cultural studies shows us that it also is uh, uh, you know uh, these this sense of power, choice, pleasure and identity formation could really be illusions in a certain uh, in a certain sense. Uh, because it actually is um, a practice that involves pretense because the you know the as we, we saw later on um, the you know the whole format right uh, is already determined or predetermined so there is what critics call a simulated okay a simulated performance in time one is performing according to certain codes of performance right so this whole as you know cultural studies talks about issues of power issues of politics issues of signs and signifying practices so this is also something that is entailed in the study of eating out as a cultural practice then we saw that there is a difference between eating in and eating out where eating in is seen as a pro tradition uh, tradition practice where you know uh, there is a reaffirmation of um, boundaries uh, among members of the household there is a maintenance of tradition there is stability and there are reaffirmations of divisions of uh, borders of divisions of labor for instance whereas in eating out we found that 
eating out could be uh, could be a uh, you know uh, an uncomplicated exercise in immediate gratification of one of one's um, you know um, culinary tastes or drives and uh, at the same time uh, it is also seen as an uh, you know uh, a platform for experience for conviviality for you know uh, variety etc okay so whereas where, where uh, eating in was seen as a traditional practice eating out was seen as a non traditional practice then we also found that compared to pre modern times the rise of the market in modern times led to as far as eating out is concerned led to an urbanization of mores and and manners where eating out was also uh, you know an act of necessity rather than pleasure right and there was also you know as we saw at least in 18th century europe the beginning of the opening of the coffee houses right which was anti hierarchical and anti traditional both in location and practice therefore eating out we also saw transforms emotions into commodities where the individual is presented with consumer items but it is also seen as a mannered exercise imitative and customary okay so let's now come to the topic of discussion at hand today in this lecture and the topic as you know is biology as seen from a cultural studies angle or oh, sorry perspective and let me as always declare the key source texts in this lecture the key source texts from which we shall be gleaning the points and from where i shall also be quoting and then unpacking the quotations like we do in the classrooms right when we read extracts from uh, you know the prescribed text these texts are chris barker's cultural studies theory and practice and chris barker's making sense of cultural studies and p buzak's uh, encyclopedia of semiotics well let me take you back to the first lecture okay the first lecture in this module was devoted to the body and we saw in uh, you know in that lecture how body is um, e you know easily appropriated by cultural studies in uh, you know uh, in a very rich sort of a way right you usually think that the body is a given we realize that the body is also something that is appropriated by this course and therein if you look at this slide we saw that framing the body and looking at body through cultural practices we find that there are you know framing the body establishes structures of power and desire right and in es being established in structures of power and desire um, the body uh, the body falls into a discourse where knowledge and meaning emanate from the structures uh, of power and the and um, the realities and the rhetoric of desire we also saw okay this whole uh, this whole discourse of uh, of 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 the corporeal and the discourse of incorporation as far as the body is concerned is it also entails from a cultural studies perspective it it involves ideas objects human human beings in relation to cultural political and economic structures so the body like any other site okay any other site where culture happens right this is important for us to understand that way that even uh, you know the uh, the body is something that is deeply inscribed in cultural political and economic structures okay so let's now let's now carry on and we are looking at chris barker and we are reading from uh, making sense of cultural studies in this quotation barker draws attention to the fact that you know uh, it is not it has not been the right move okay as far as cultural studies is concerned or the, even the humanities is concerned it has not been a good move to keep you know biology um, or the even the rigors of you know of science away from the humanities in general and uh, cultural studies in particular of course we have areas like the philo uh, you know philosophy of uh, and and sociology of science and technology the history of science and technology okay so in the same way barker holds that we should bring in the rigors and uh, of empiricism the rigors 
of sin and here we look at, uh, at some of his formulations as far as one branch of science is concerned that is biology. Now, let us read from Barker. Cultural studies has suffered by sealing itself off from the empirical rigors of science and the embodied nature of human beings. This is very important. Very often we make uh, this distinction which is a Cartesian distinction known as Cartesian dualism between the body and the mind, okay. forgetting um, unfortunately that we are embodied beings, right? we are beings in a body and that the mind as far as we believe that it emanates from the brain, the mind is um, also something that emanates from the body. So, Barker here draws our attention to the embodied nature, to our embodied nature, the fact that we are in bodies, right. As such, he goes on to say, as such, I shall be putting the case that the languages of evolutionary biology or psychology along with those of psychotherapy and a meaningful spirituality would be available uh, sorry so would be value, valuable additions to the cultural studies vocabulary now obviously what he's doing here is he's bringing a well established domain in the sciences which is evolutionary biology and from which if you remember um, you know either in lecture 3 or 4 in module 1 we talked uh, you know we talked about evolutionary psychology its various principles etc its importance for cultural studies now let's remind ourselves again through chris barker's words right that the languages the discourses of evolutionary biology and in particular evolutionary psychology which tells us or gives us knowledge about how our minds developed over you know huge periods of evol evolutionary development of the species right this is something that we should bring into uh, a study of cultural studies right uh, uh, sorry cultural studies uh, analysis of biology so again let me read once again as such I shall be putting the case that the languages of evolutionary biology, evolutionary psychology along with those of psychotherapy. Okay? Now, how are these two related Psy psychotherapy and psycho uh, evolutionary psychology? If we understand how the mind developed over time, okay, what you could say uh, you know what, uh, what the, uh, the so called primitive brain was the reptilian brain for instance, the mammalian brain and how for instance fear. Uh, fear um, and, and other very strong emotions are emotions that have been with us in our evolutionary development. Okay. This the knowledge of these things and how you know uh, one uh, you know how uh, one could study our present uh, responses uh, particularly with strong responses like fear and anger. If you study these in relation to how we have evolved and now how our psychology has evolved may eventually okay, add to psychotherapy and has in fact added to psychotherapy and what he calls also meaningful spirituality, a meaningful spirituality in the sense that we understand our, how our emotions, how we as embodied beings, how we have come to have the very emotions that sometimes rule us. Okay. So, <coughs> the important point that Barker makes is not just that we you know sort of reveal the you know what happens in biology as a discourse and we re reveal uh, what cultural studies has to tell us he also has a pragmatic uh, you know um, uh, he has a pragmatic uh, uh, agenda so to speak here in trying to say that the so so many of the malaises so many of the psychological illnesses psychosomatic illnesses that we have in modern times uh, may be understood and cured and may be a therapeutic exercise when we look at ourselves uh, through a biocultural perspective okay so this is one of the ways i am going to look at two of two ways of looking at biology to cultural studies the first way is this that we should not we ought not to take out the findings or ought not to uh, ignore the findings being given to us by areas like evolutionary biology and evolutionary psychology studies and emotion for instance and what these have to tell us what light this uh, these have to shed as far as our current behavior uh, in um, you know which affects our cultural practices which determine our cultural practices uh, these are concerned okay so the fundamental point now 
the fundamental point in any study of culture in relation to biology or any study of biology in relationship or in relation to culture okay, will point to these two important domains that is human obviously human biology and human culture. And our question here is or our um, you know our uh, uh, job here in this lecture is to find out the, the relation between human biology and human culture. To ask questions like is human biology different from human culture or are there overlappings if there is a relationship what what uh, are the mappings that can be done, what are the connections that uh, can be done which throws light on both ourselves as embodied human beings and also ourselves as cultural beings. Okay? So, the chief uh, debate that would be brought to you or that would be shown to you by any cultural studies uh, scholar is the debate the very um, you know well known debate between nature and nurture. Right? If you look at the slide here nature is um, you are talking about biology here and nurture is about cultural construction. Right? Now, the debate is this, okay. the debate is uh, is nature the only determinant okay, of, of you know our both our physical and cultural um, you know physical and cultural uh, features right, uh, is nature everything. Uh, critiques of this school of thought would say that there is if you believe in Com completely that in completely that we are made by our biology okay that biology is all then we run the risk of biology what is called biological reductionism biological reductionism simply means that we reduce okay we reduce all our analysis or our propositions formulations and articulations about human beings to the bio, you know, to simply the biological aspect, okay, and um, the the other part of the debate is to to do with nurture, okay. That is how one uh, you know, uh, and the importance here definitely of the cultural environment, okay, the cultural environment in which we live, and uh, the you know uh, the orientation here would be called the theoretical orientation here would be called one of cultural constructionism. Okay. In so far as critics believe that we are everything about us is cultural construction, okay. we are made not by biology, uh, biology may be a given. In fact, many of, uh, many of the cultural critics won't even to say that even biology is not a given that even biology if you remember the second our second uh, discussion on gender okay where even uh, you know the sex gender binary today is said to be untenable where sex is also uh, you know uh, considered to be a matter of language and discourse or, okay so uh, here too we find that in the nature nurture debate uh, everything is uh, or at least to a large extent uh, we are supposed to be culturally constructed right so the debate or the formulations on um, one aspect of the formulations on uh, this you know interface between biology and culture would point to the nature nurture debate okay and definitely there are proponents uh, of uh, nature as well as there are proponents of nurture and the debate is one that is still raging. So, um, then critics like Barker say that you know instead of harping on the differences between biological reductionism okay, and cultural constructionism, let us see how best you know we can make an alliance okay, and uh, please look at the slide here. He calls for an alliance between evolutionary biology and cultural studies. Remember this uh, you know he calls for, uh, for such an alliance not simply you know to add to the debate on uh, nature versus culture, but also to find out ways in which certain you know uh, certain uh, malaise, uh, malaises if I may if you will uh, that plague uh, our species could be 
you know, or, or you know, um, they were, could have therapy, which uh, a therapy which you know, in which there is an alliance or uh, there is a borrowing from both evolutionary biology and cultural studies. Now, let us read again from Barker. In order that we can engage with human biology, but also avoid accusations of biological reductionism, we need to deconstruct the opposition of nature and culture from both directions. This is what we have been talking about just you know on this while okay, just a um, few moments ago. He says that um, in order that we can engage with human biologically biology fruitfully okay, and at the same time avoid you know the label or the accusation of uh, reductionism. Okay. What we have to do is we need to dismantle or, or we need to um, uh, you know we, we need to get rid of or deconstruct as he uses the word deconstruct the opposition of nature and culture or of nature and nurture from both directions. Okay. Let us read on. On the one hand culture is an outgrowth of human beings learning and adapting within their natural ancestral environment. Definitely, he says that culture is you know uh, uh, one of the ways in which we can dismantle or deconstruct this is definitely that we are natural beings, we are we have a natural ancestral that is evolutionary uh, environment and culture is something that definitely did not uh, you know develop or grow. Um, away from the natural ancestral or evolutionary environment. Okay. So, in that sense the nature culture or nature nurture debate and the you know very sharp divide is something definitely that is we have to recognize as being untenable. So, uh, now you realize how, how uh, biology becomes a part in fact of cultural studies instead of remaining just a science as we know it. Then Barker goes on to say right on the other hand not only is nature already a concept in language that is it is not a pure state of being beyond science, but also the natural world has come under the sway of human knowledge this is important. Okay. See just a while ago what was the point that he was making? Right. The point that he was making was that of course, we have been born in a natural ancestral environment which has its own characteristics, which has its own features and the history that we cannot deny a history and a prehistory rather that we cannot deny. Okay. So, this is a fact of culture accepting the fact that it is a part of biology. He says on the other hand. Okay, biology or nature or the study of nature would also have to acknowledge the fact that it is a part of culture. How is it a part of culture? It is a part of culture as it says as he says here again I am quoting him again that not only is nature already a concept in language. Okay. Nature is there is a discourse of nature, there is a way in you know how a way how we talk about nature, there is a way in which we look at nature or describe nature okay. and the description of nature cannot be completely okay, cannot be completely uh, kind of taken away uh, from the, the you know the context, the cultural context in which we use. Okay, we describe nature in the first place. So, that is why he says nature is not a pure state of being beyond science. Okay. So, nature too and it might be difficult for some you know some scientists or biologists to accept this, but the fact or uh, the argument at least being given by Barker here is that nature too is a matter of signifying practices. Okay. But also the natural world has come under the sway of human knowledge and institutions. Indeed, not only may we speak of the socialization of nature, but through the investigations of genetic science, we are learning to intrude even further into the so called natural human body. Okay. So, Barker is very uh, you know very in fact, I think he very strongly puts forward 
um, his argument okay that uh, you will have to see nature and culture as overlapping entities and a time has come when cultural studies has begun to look at biology where the binaries very rigid binaries of nature and culture uh, would have to be broken down. Then uh, again further from Barker and it is important for us to as I keep saying over and over again is important for us to look uh, since cultural studies is a description is a way of talking this course is a way of talking about things. It is important for us to look at how okay, how uh, these formulations in what, what um, uh, discourse these formulations are being given by uh, these important scholars of cultural studies. Okay. So, I will read from here and then I shall explain. Human culture and human biology have co-evolved this is important okay, have co-evolved and are indivisible in that culture forms an environment for the human body and feeds into evolutionary change. Evolutionary change is not therefore, a matter simply uh, or purely okay, of biology. E evolutionary changes take place right take place or, or, or are also interestingly motivated by uh, by culture and cultural practices in a species right so again human culture and human biology have co-evolved and are indivisible in that culture forms an environment culture is an environment for the human body and feeds into evolutionary change hence environmental change which includes social and cultural aspects of human life can change biological developmental outcomes. This is most important. Okay. Of course, the time scales involved in human cultural change and evolutionary adaptations are radically different. Okay. Uh, I may have mentioned in the lecture in the in the, in, in my fourth lecture on module 1 uh, that um, uh, the time scale as far as every human evolution or evolution of a species is concerned, where you know the time taken for an adaptation to be established in an important way to be uh, mutations that are not not sort of freak, um, freak cases or, or mutations or changes that are there adaptations that are there for there for, uh, to stay with us. It takes um, from a thousand to two thousand generations. Okay this is important that this is the time scale it takes from a thousand to two thousand uh, generations for any change important adaptive change uh, physical change biological change to be instantiated right. So, obviously cultural changes the time scale is narrower than the biological changes. Now, the latter that is evolutionary adaptations the latter take place as he says over eons of time while the former is more obviously measured in decades remember this is what we had just discussed while cultural change is measured in decades evolutionary change is measured over thousands of years ok. So, say from a 20, um, um, 20 thousand to 200 thousand years uh, uh, you know or 100 a uh, thousand and more generations. Um, should have passed before any important change takes place. You see how different it is. Further, ba Barker says, thus we currently operate with a human genome and brain structure that evolved a long time ago in quite different environmental, including cultural circumstances, from those in which we live today. Uh, evolutionary psychologists have also pointed, you know, to some, uh, you could almost say, anomalies that are there with us. Right. For instance, it is said that we, we fear um, spiders and snakes more than automobiles where perhaps uh, you know our chances of being killed by you know or being hurt by uh, automobiles um, chances are more than being hurt by snakes uh, or our, our chances of being hurt by electro you know electro electrical sockets is more are more chances are more than being hurt by snakes or, um, or tigers. But because we you know, uh, because our minds, uh, you know, bear this legacy of evolution. Okay, it may seem a, a little anomalous for us, but it is a fact that these things are with us to stay. Because at some point in our evolution, we actually had to, uh, 
uh, you know um, had to fight ferocious animals on a daily basis or we had uh, you know uh, more encounters with snakes than we have today. Okay. So, these are some of the anomalies that are being pointed to here. Therefore, when you talk about human nature right uh, as Barker says evolutionary biology negates the possibility of a fixed unchanging human nature right. So, if you talk about human nature or you know uh, uh, what, the, what are the characteristics if we ask questions like what are the characteristics of being human or even that are essential or remember the word ontology which we use so much in uh, in uh, module 1 and modules 1 and 2. Uh, so, we cannot say that there is an ontologically unchanging or essential human nature because culture as we have seen feeds into also human development. Barker therefore says human beings form overlapping pools of genetic variation not distinct races each with its own genome. Therefore, again critics like Barker say that we therefore have to practice what is called the methodological holism right. We have to have a holistic approach and not you know remain within the discourse the old discourse the old debate of nature versus culture and we have to have a methodology in our research and understanding which is non reductionist okay, which uh, takes cognizance of complex systems and which holds that there is a systemic or a system based context to every uh, development also in biology and interactionalism and over determination. This is a point that we had discussed earlier over determination in that there may be many causes uh, that we are not aware of that contribute to a certain phenomenon. Okay. So, we should have a methodology which is therefore holistic in nature which is neither completely scientific nor completely based on humanities. Then Barker also draws attention to the fact that um, emotions are you know from even from bi what biology has to tell us about emotions this is also important for us in understanding ourselves as cultural beings. And I am quoting from Barker the roots of emotional response are biochemical to understand that the roots are of our emotions are biological and though emotions are culturally mediated the sharing of broad emotional reactions is one of the features that binds us together as human beings. We all feel feel fear and we all have the potential to love. So, even when you understand this commonality with, uh, you know among all races among all peoples of the world that we are the bearers of a common legacy of emotions even that he, he says may lead us uh, you know to towards a therapeutic um, and it may be a therapeutic exercise in understanding ourselves as common holders of emotions. Then I said that I would talk about another uh, aspect all this while we have been talking about evolutionary biology, psychology, nature, nurture, uh, emotions etcetera. I will quickly end by talking about another way of looking at biology from cultural studies and this is known as biosemiotics. By now you know what semiotics is. Semiotics is the study of science. Okay. So, F. S. Rothschild was uh, uh, you know the person who coined the term biosemiotics. Now, semiotics is as you know the production and further the interpretation of signs and codes. Okay. When we looked at structuralism we understood that we are we ourselves produce signs okay, and then we ourselves interpret signs. Right. So, biosemiotics then would mean what? Biosemiotics would mean looking at biology also as a system of signs and codes. This is extremely important and this is a I think a very important contribution uh, of cultural studies in try in its effort to look at biology also as you know uh, not as, as material uh, givens, but also as a system of signs and codes that organisms give out and interpret. Now, let us look uh, a bit in detail uh, at biosemiotics. Okay. Now, biosemiotics would say that all you know life processes or all life processes could be seen as living in a semiosphere. Okay. We have come across words like we you know words like atmosphere for instance, but look at this beautiful word here semiosphere. Okay. All life processes are part of a semiosphere or is part of an environment of signs and codes right, where there is where they operate within a semiotic dynamic. Okay. So, now let us let us see what what are the components Okay. what components uh, uh, or what com what um, semiosphere comprises. 
Okay. Now, living forms and processes, uh, it will not be difficult for us to, uh, to accept this, okay, that living forms and processes also communicate. Right. It is not that only human beings communicate or that you know uh, what we call uh, the greater uh, animals communicate. We also know that bacteria communicate, okay, okay, it may not be in the way that we communicate, but bacteria also okay, and uh, all organisms for, for that matter we may argue uh, you know obey and take part in a system of communication. Right. So, these systems of communication lead to what we call established communication practices or habits. Okay. There is a habit formation, a habit formation of all organisms, okay, all biological organisms okay, uh, uh, following a certain code of communication and then settling within or having a, a strong communication code that, uh, in that instantiates itself through habit formation. Therefore, these codes or relationship between codes could also be seen as sign relations, okay. a matter of coding and you know, encoding and decoding signs. Right. And also biological systems and that is living forms and processes could also be seen as living within a science system or operating within a science system. So, you see how the cultural studies one of the most important uh, you know aspects of theoretical aspects of cultural studies that of science systems of signifying practices uh, you know uh, could be um, applied as is shown by uh, you know uh, shown by uh, cultural studies uh, theorists could be applied to uh, living forms and processes. Let me, uh, let me also state here that it is uh, you know not this is not being said um, as an analogy or a metaphor uh, as a as a matter of metaphor. It seems as a you know it seems as if this actually happens that living beings and processes do communicate. Okay, and they do follow a system of codes and so we may say that biology is also a matter of semiotics or of uh, you know giving out science and understanding science and operating within a science system. Therefore, what now what are the components of the semiosphere? Let us look at this slide here please. The components of the semiosphere or where we can find you know signs or where you can find encoding and decoding, these are sounds. Okay. These as far as the organic world is concerned, these are sounds, these are odors or smells, colors, waves, electric fields and motion among many others. Right. So, these are also you know um, signs within a system of communication. Right. Today many uh, scholars from uh, the communication system from information technology, many philosophers of information technology uh, of electronics say that uh, you know um, these are also uh, everything is a science system right where uh, an electric field is a, is a science system there is encoding and decoding motion waves colors every, you know these are also science systems so there is an increasing uh, awareness and uh, ex acceptance to a certain degree that uh, you know um, the world uh, even people even say that you know the scholars even say that perhaps the world the universe itself may be seen as being underlain by a system of codes Okay, that there is a there is a code and uh, I'm sure in the sciences there is this you know is looking there is this hunt for the philosopher's stone, which is the ultimate code that underlies the universe. So it is important for us to know that it is not simply a metaphoric you know by metaphorical flourish that we are saying that uh, you know organic life is a matter of science systems of sending out signals. Uh, in it is in in fact. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, it is so that it uh, it is so, or that uh, organic systems do live in a what is called semiosphere. Therefore, uh, we'll end by saying that living beings do not operate as mechanical simply as mechanical beings. Okay, but living beings are message makers. Okay, uh, if you if you uh, accept the fact that complex organic beings like human beings and some animals okay, are message makers, they make the message messages and then they, 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 they encode their messages and they decode them you know establishing very successful communication systems. We have to also 
um, uh, we have, have to also kind of extend this to all life. Right? So, living beings are all living beings are not just mechanical beings, but they are message makers and they are communicators. Nature therefore, okay, this is important, nature therefore from this point is a set of codes and symbols right? and uh, therefore, sci the scientific enterprise may be seen as uh, also may be read as an attempt made by human beings to decode the set of symbols and codes that kind of comprised nature. Okay. And finally, let me uh, quote from J. Hofmeier, okay, an important name in this in the study of biosemiotics. Uh, J. Hofmeier says that the sign, okay, the sign rather than the molecule is the basic unit for studying life. I think this sums up very beautifully at least what we have been talking about all this while uh, about biosemiotics. Okay. So, if what if you say biology proper has been looking at the molecule as the basic unit for studying life. Okay. We perhaps also need to look at the sign as the basic unit for studying life and maybe such an enterprise and such a motivation or orientation may tell us things uh, that have been hidden or that we have not been able to look uh, you know understand or we have not uh, because we have not looked at it from that perspective, this kind of orientation may tell us or give us knowledge in both domains in both in biology and both and, and also in cultural studies. Right? So, we will now go on uh, to the discussion and uh, a couple of questions that as always we will be uh, trying you know uh, we will set questions for ourselves and then try and answer them. If you get a question like, what is the chief debate in cultural analysis of biology? Okay. The answer is that the debate in the chief debate or you could say the mega debate in cultural analysis of biology and even in biology for that matter is the debate between nature and nurture right? or you could say the debate between nature and culture. Right? Now, what happens? Uh, when we make a clear divide here and you know what happens when we try to understand um, ourselves only from the point of view of nature only as you know natural beings right what happens is we fall prey to a way of doing research through a methodology which is called uh, which is called biological reductionism biological reductionism then you can also write that biological reductionism uh, simply means reducing all knowledge about ourselves to biology okay to or, or in fact uh, or as hofmeier says okay uh, to studying the molecule as the basic unit of life on the other hand we will have to say on the other hand uh, nurture looks at, uh, is about cultural constructionism the other side of the debate or uh, when we look at everything as culturally constructed very probably even throw out the pure so called purely. Now, I know this is a problem uh, when you say purely biological, but if we completely evade right, uh, what the biological sciences have to give us, then we also fall uh, you know um, we also make the mistake of, of you know adopting a methodology which is pure uh, constructionism. So, the point here is in even as you write about the debate you may say that today the debate is um, held to be untenable because it's uh, it's this these kind of strong binaries are no longer tenable, right? And our uh, the, or the efforts of so many cultural scholars has been to see how nature will interface with culture and how we can build a new discourse, right? Which involves writing about nature through culture and also writing about culture through nat nature. And also we then finally, we have to say that through Barker that there is a need to deconstruct the opposition of nature and culture as, is, as we said just now from both directions. Okay. So, if you get a 5 mark question for instance and you simply do not say that the debate is about nature versus culture, then we also go on to maybe quote critics like Barker and to say how this uh, there is a need uh, to deconstruct this primary binary opposition. Next, if you get a question like define methodological holism particularly in reference to the study of biology and culture, then you say that methodological holism is 
you know and is an orientation really is an orientation which holds that one should have a non reductionist uh, uh, you know methodology as one uh, as one uh, articulates okay articulates or makes propositions or as one writes about or builds a discourse about biology and of culture right and methodological holism looks at uh, you know organic beings as complex systems right and the systemic context the context of the system okay is something that is also um, appropriated or the something that at least that is something that is pointed to by methodological holism that we have to look at organic systems as complex systems even if even at cultural systems that call as um, being complex systems with a systemic context right and we also have to very importantly accept the fact that there is an interaction between nature and culture which we call interactionalism okay the theory of interactionalism holds that culture feeds into biology culture feeds into development in fact in our evolutionary history culture has always contributed even to biological development okay finally over determination uh, over determination as we saw uh, is definitely a part of methodological holism why because over determination has is has a holistic attitude okay holistic orientation in its in its avowal uh, of the fact that there may be so many more causes to a particular effect that uh, causes that uh, are beyond um, our grasp right. Then what is biosemiotics? Biosemiotics is defined as um, you know uh, as a domain uh, which sees biology in terms of culture in terms of one of the um, one of the chief articulations of cultural studies that is semiotics and it sees the production uh, uh, biology or organic forms as a, a system of signs and codes which have been both produced by the organism and are interpreted by or the organism. In this living forms and processes are seen as uh, engaging in communication and communication system which is based on signs and codes following uh, the following of which leads to a habit formation in even very uh, in the so called lesser organisms and these therefore communication uh, uh, within living forms and processes are matters of sign relations and sign systems. Finally, what is the semiosphere? It is held in biosemiotics that all life processes live in and operate within a semiosphere, which is an ambience and environment of signs and codes, and within a semiotic dynamic. The semiosphere includes sounds, odors, colors, and even electric fields, okay, motion and waves. All these scenes, all these things are to be also interpreted. Okay, if we have to, uh, you know, if we, if we have to look at biology from a cultural cultural studies and semiotic approach, these have to be interpreted as part of the semiosphere. Okay, so I hope this, um, uh, you know, our deliberations uh, on bias uh, on biosemiotics, on emotion, on evolutionary biology, particularly also through the words of uh, you know Chris Barker, as we have read parts of his text here. I hope this has been important, and from those of you who are uh, doing biotechnology, for instance, okay, could perhaps also benefit from this this uh, rather different angle that has been brought to you and this interface of biology and culture is one that I believe uh, is a very fruitful interface and has so much to tell us as researchers and students. Thank you so much.